from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. We are here today with pianist, vocalist, arranger, composer, educator, Henry Butler. Henry, welcome to the Library of Congress. Good to be here. I know you spent some time listening to some things in our collection today. What did you hear? Oh, God, I'll tell you what. Uh, this, re this collection is so rich with all kinds of things. Um, we wound up actually listening to uh, some of the early uh, prison songs uh, out of the Lomax collection. Heard some of the stuff from the Parchment Prison, uh, 1938, 39. Um, and uh, we actually wound up hearing some of the cowboy songs. That it wasn't intended uh, this time, but uh, that's what came up. And um, but we talked about a lot of things that they have uh, in the collection, and um, hopefully I'll be uh, getting some of those, some of the more, un some of the unpublished uh, things. There's a lot to discover. Oh. Or as we say, there's always more. Oh, yes. I For those that. viewers, listeners, researchers who may not be quite as familiar with you, let's try to establish some basic facts. You were born when and where? In Louisiana, in New Orleans. Um, Your date of birth? 1948, September 21st. What neighborhood in New Orleans? Uh, <clears throat> well, I was actually born in the only black hospital in the city. Mm -hmm. And when I was born there, uh, when I left, they closed it down. Mm -hmm. No, the truth is, it, it stayed open for a few years. And then it was bought by the archdiocese of the city. But what neighborhood did you grow up in? Um, I started out in it was up t what they called Uptown New Orleans, but it's sort of like Central City. Um, we used to call it the Hood, near Third and Daniel, uh, Third Street and Daniel, and uh, and then when my Mother and father divorced about when I was probably in my fourth year. Uh, we moved to the Calio Projects. And I, <coughs> I went to uh, boarding school uh, in Baton Rouge. But when, we, when, I, when I would come home in the summers, that's where I would come home to. And then in high school, or probably, yeah, it was either my senior year in high school or my freshman year in college, we moved out to uh, what they call out front of town, uh, mm -hmm. near Chapitulis and uh, Delache. And that's where I lived until uh, 19, until the 1990s. And what kind of music was around the house when you were growing oh up? Oh gosh. What were you surrounded by? Well, I started listening to standards when I was probably about 12 years old. My mom used to buy these CD, not CDs, sorry. She used to buy this, these albums uh, she'd, she'd go to these stores that would sell these, uh, that had these bargain bins, and she'd get anything that had piano music, uh, mm -hmm. and she'd just buy it, right? And so one day she brought, she brought home um, some Fats Waller music. I mean, I didn't know it at the time, because I, I was really mainly interested in, in the musical part, and I wasn't trying to find out who was playing what. Uh, but <clears throat> there was one piece 
I really uh, took to a piece entitled uh, The Viper's Drag. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really think it was somebody like uh, Dick Hyman playing all these things. But I'm, I'm not totally sure about it because that record got lost over the years. And uh, what did and you like about Viper's Drag? Well, I liked the swing part. I mean, at the time, I couldn't tell you, you know, when I was 12 or 11, whenever it was, I started listening to it. It was just different from what I was listening to um, uh, on the radio and hearing on TV, that kind of thing. Um, and just about that time, my mom had gotten a TV, um, which was sort of new in the, you know, amongst us ghetto black folk. Um, so I was, I was happy to sort of get into that, that new style, the new style for me. And um, uh, it had, it had uh, some swing and it just, it felt different to me at the time. It felt, it had different uh, sections to it. Had a, I mean, now I know it, it had a sort of a stride section. It had a sort of a swing section and sort of a boogie woogie section. Can you demonstrate what you mean by stride and boogie woogie? Do you remember that song, Viper Track? Can you play a little bit? Oh, yeah. Uh, the version that I uh, used to listen to started out like this. this transition and then it goes into the stride section goes back into stride and so it, it had all of that in it and I had never really heard that kind of thing on record before she brought that uh, back brought that home and then she started bringing uh, Duke Ellington stuff uh, on al uh, vinyl uh, as well as uh, Stuff from the Ray Conneth Orchestra oh, yeah. and Fred Waring, and 
you know, um, seems kind of corny to some of us today, but at that time, that was fun for me because I was learning all these new tunes and I was, I couldn't play them, but I was still hearing them. So you had a piano in the house, yeah? Well, at that time I didn't. Oh. Not really. So how would you learn these songs, just by memory? I would, I would, I would memorize them, and when I would get to a piano, I would sort of try to pick out the melodies. So where would you find a piano? Was there one? Well, there was a neighbor there? who had a piano uh, close to me, and it was one of those big upright pianos. And uh, I'd go out, I'd go over there and try to pick out melodies. I, I, I had pretty good ears. I had perfect, what they called perfect pitch. And so it wasn't hard for me to, but many of the, <coughs> many of the melodies were pretty complicated and the, I mean, the arrangements were pretty, uh, uh, pretty involved. I never really tried to figure out all of that stuff, but uh, it's like the first thing I, uh, one of the first things she brought home, and I think this was from the Ray Conneth Orchestra, Let's see if I can, uh, things just stayed with me over the years and I started uh, listening to I started looking for the radio stations that played those kinds of things that played the Duke Ellington and the Count Basie kinds of things the uh, uh, a lot of stuff from the 30s and 40s what station in New Orleans played that kind of music well, there was a station called uh, WNNR, and I think that was an AM station. And there was a, a WDSU FM, I think that was an FM station. And we, we had gotten, we had gotten a new stereo in the house probably a year or two before I started getting all these CDs. And she'd also bring home uh, stuff by Al Hurt and um, anything, I guess, she could find in those bargain bins. So when did you become aware that there's this rich tradition of New Orleans piano playing? Probably when I was, I mean, I, I, I knew that it was there, but I, I, I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to it until I was in college, actually. Uh, I could play some Professor Longhair when I was in high school, but hey, when you're there and you hear it all the time, you sort of take it for granted. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, I could play Tipitina's definitely when I was in high school, and I might have even played it uh, for some gigs uh, we, we definitely did a lot of the, we played a lot of the classics on gigs that we did. <coughs> and incidentally, I was performing professionally when I was 14 um, and still in school, you know. So uh, by the time I met, uh, say, Alvin Batiste in, 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 in my junior year in college, uh, I started realizing that New Orleans was unique. I started realizing that uh, um, it was a real contributor to the to the American cultural footprint. Now, can you tell just from listening if a player is from New Orleans? Uh, sometimes. Sometimes. I mean, wh what would you hear that that clues you in? That, oh, that a little like nuances. There are little nuances that take place uh, when the player really understands the culture. Now, it doesn't mean that if, if I hear these nuances that 
the player is actually from New Orleans, but it does mean that, it, to me, that the player really understands the cultural dialect. Now, can you talk a little bit about this dialect, about this footprint, about well, what these, these nuances are? Yeah. Well, every, every language um, has different flavors and different dialects and different ways of being delivered, right? So <coughs> we're, we're, we're speaking in the English language, and so when you go to New York, you hear uh, a different way of delivering that language. Is it like an accent? Yeah, sort of, yeah. It's mm -hmm. like, like uh, uh, people use the example of Bostonians saying ka and, and uh, sort of broadening the a or the ah, ah sound in a word like car so that it maybe turns out to be more like C-A-H-R something like that. Uh, or if you go to New Orleans and you hear people speaking in the English language, you might hear a little bit of a different accent. Sometimes it sounds French, sometimes it sounds uh, what people might call flat. Can you give us examples? Yeah. Um, like the flight, the flat sound might be something like, where you at, bruh? What's happening? Mm. Right? And uh, the French or Creole sound uh, could be something like, hey, che. Uh, um, how you doing today? And Fats Domino is a great example of a guy who sings with that little Creole accent. Uh, he says, uh, he says, um, hello, Josephine. Josephine, right? Yeah. Uh, how do you do? Do you remember me, baby? Like I remember you, you used to laugh at me and holler hoo hoo hoo. You used to live over yonder by the railroad track. I used to, you used to use my umbrella. I used to tote you on my back, you know that kind of thing. Um, so I mean every. Every language, every code, every piece of music can have nuances. And uh, if, you, if you are playing, say, in the Professor Longhair style, uh, you know that it has just a tinge of swing to it, which is kind of a, it's one of the nuances. Uh. Ah. So you have, you have a little bit of a, a Caribbean rhythm there. Some people call it mambo beat. Uh, some Sometimes people it's a calypso also. Well, some people call it that. Or a carnival sound. Uh, but I, I, I would say that it's all based on the bambula. Hmm. Uh, uh, Right? And then you can play it slower or faster. And, um, and any rhythm, uh, any type rhythm has 
um, its dialect so that somebody um, in Georgia, say like Bo Diddley, can use that and it sounds a little bit different. I mean, one of the, one of the prime rhythms of Bo Diddley was, yeah. People in New Orleans use the, use the same rhythm, but um, when you put everything together with the drums and all that, uh, it starts to sound real different. And that's really uh, based on a lot of the things in, that, in the New Orleans subculture. You've mentioned Professor Longhair a couple of times. Mm -hmm. Let's establish who he was. This is Roy Bird, right? Yes. He's a rather extraordinary player, a stylist. Everybody in New Orleans knows him. Yeah. Yes. When did you first encounter his music? Well, <coughs> the first recordings I know from uh, Mr. Bird uh, were from the 1947, 48, somewhere in there, 49 uh, period, I didn't really start, I, mean, I used to hear his stuff when I was very young, when I was like four or five back in the mid 50s, <coughs> excuse me, and, uh, but I was too young to really be able to play anything. I mean, I used to hear Tipitina's. Um, later on, when we used to go to the Mardi Gras parades, we'd always hear the Mardi Gras in New Orleans. There's several names for that t uh, song, but that's the one that apparently was copyrighted uh, under his name. Um, so these are standards. Oh, these New are New Orleans culture. standards, yeah, for that culture. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. And then um, we used to hear, oh, well, he, was pl he played on Big Chief, uh, but that was written by Earl King, and that was a little later. That was probably in the early 60s or so. Uh, Big Chief sounds like this. particular piece, that particular song demonstrates a very unique style of piano. Uh, just like, just as Professor Longhair had demonstrated all of his life, uh, what Professor Longhair did for piano uh, is brought more rhythm, more syncopation into uh, piano playing. Before that, there were many great piano players. There were many great boogie-woogie players, shuffle players, players who uh, uh, used some boogie-woogie and some shuffle and some uh, just normal blues playing like Johnny Johnson. Uh, but Professor Longhair had the had the, the Caribbean rhythms, had some blues on top of that. And when he was singing, he also used uh, a little country flavor because he could yodel a little bit as well. 
Do you hear any kind of link or connection between Professor Longhair or someone like James Booker and Jelly Roll Morton? Well, yeah. I mean, Professor Longhair uh, occasionally would use uh, uh, would use this uh, and that's actually where Ray Charles got that from. A mess around. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but but it's a strange. It 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 actually. If you go back to Jelly Roll. Uh, Jelly Roll uses that in, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the piece now. And then, um, right, right off the bat, I can't remember the name of the piece that that's in but it's 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 definitely one of his uh, prime licks in that piece and um, so Professor Longhair, Ray Charles and anybody else that used it in the 50s that's exactly where they got it. Before we leave Jelly Roll can you just talk for a moment about what he represents to you and the New Orleans piano tradition? Jelly Roll was a very prolific composer and and he was a hell of a pianist and he knew it. Mm. Uh, <laughs> you know and, and I think a lot of people, I, I have to, I, I admire him a lot for not only um, having such great proficiency but for actually having the courage in those days to own it and to uh, appreciate the fact that he was great. And, you know, people talk about the fact that he, he says he was the, uh, uh, in the originating jazz musician. Well, um, you know, there may be some validity to that. I mean, he was actually the one of the, if not the first, one of the first great jazz composers. There's no question about that. Um, I I I appreciate his courage. I mean, there was there was certainly a lot that black people and people of color. Uh, had to go through in those days and um, to sort of stand his ground and to own what he did and appreciate what he did uh, was not easy. You know, and especially, you yes. And especially when he didn't get paid for a lot of what he wrote. Uh, and I guess his family and his estate didn't get. Uh, any money for that until the consent decree came down in what 1961 something like that mm -hmm. you know you are sitting on the spot where Jelly Roll recorded his famous uh, songs and stories in 1938 here at the library I feel very honored so if Jelly were here with us today what would you ask him um I would ask him how did he see himself in the scheme of of uh, the racial situation I would ask him <coughs> um, how did he see himself uh, as compared to Willie the Lion Smith or, or some of the other pianists of the day. And I'm pretty sure I know what the answer would be. But um, 
I, I think he felt he was like the greatest pianist of, of that time. Mm -hmm. And um, Jelly was a Creole? He was, yes. What do you think the impact has been of Creole musicians on <laughs> American music? <laughs> well, I think Creoles were responsible for uh, most of jazz. Um, what they did was many of these guys were conservatory trained and they wound up teaching some of the darker skinned people uh, how to master their instruments. And so uh, in many of the early bands uh, they were populated by mostly Creoles and a few other guys. Um, they were the guys who wrote most of the music uh, in the early years. Um, they were the guys that uh, traveled and were the ambassadors of jazz. And other than Jelly, can you give some examples? Oh, Kirori, um, um, let me, and then, um, um, Sidney Bechet, um, Baby Dodds, uh, both Baby, both Dodds, um, the, the drummer, and, um, Johnny. And John, yeah. And the clarinet. Yeah, and the clarinetist. So, I mean, um, you know, it escapes me right now. There's the trumpet player I'm trying to think of. Um, uh, From New Orleans? Yeah. Freddie Capon? No, not him, but he, he, was, he was also an ambassador. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, everybody knows about Louis Armstrong. But, but he, he was a little different from some of the people that we were just talking about. Uh, and we can get into that a little later. Um, so is there a, a central figure in between Morton and Professor Longhair? Is there somebody in the, in the 30s, 40s that you can cite that carries on that New Orleans tradition before, well, before Longhair? Well, you mean on piano? Yeah. Jelly Roll was still with us in most of the 30s. Um, so I would say that probably there's, there's no real um, y unique uh, musical personality uh, coming out of out of New Orleans uh, in the 20s. Uh, every a lot of the people left New Orleans uh, during uh, right before or during Prohibition, including Louis Armstrong and uh, Ori, and uh, you know all the guys that played with that band. They went up to Chicago. Is that because that's where the work was? That's definitely where the work was. Mm -hmm. um, but why not Kansas City? Well, there's lots of work there too. There's a lot of work there, Wide but open. that was a different ball game. Yeah. That was, that was more of a swing blues type thing. That's where Count Basie wound up, and of course Mary Lou Williams was there. Um, but the New Orleans guys went to Chicago, and then eventually some went to New York later on when, you know. Uh, bebop, post-bebop came along. Um, but the guys, th and, and, and then uh, in the 40s, of course, there was a, a bit of a revival of trad jazz, and you had people like Bunk Johnson, uh, who uh, he had an interesting tone on, on, the, on the cornet. Interesting in what way? Well, the, the vibrato was quite fast, uh, like, I mean, I, uh, I, I, something like that, you know, 
Um, I, 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 I kind of liked him a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. it's all right. Um, and, and really, I didn't get into uh, trad jazz, although I was, I've been listening to it all of my life. Uh, I didn't get to start playing it until again when I was uh, late in my college years. Um, and I got real serious about it probably ooh, early 90s or so. Uh, got serious about maybe arranging stuff. And, and a few years ago, <coughs> I organized a, a, a group that we call Papa Henry and the Steam and Syncopators, which was sort of a... Uh, was, was sort of modeled after the uh, bands that played on the SS boats uh, in New Orleans with uh, Fate Marble as the uh, arranger. And one of those bands had, Duke, had, uh, had Louis Armstrong in it, uh, probably from about 1920, 21, something like that. Fate Marable gets overlooked a lot in the histories, unfortunately. Well, he wasn't from New Orleans, yeah. so a lot of the New Orleanian, a lot of New Orleanians don't pay much attention to it, except the fact that he he did he was the band leader on one of those boats that sort of uh, spent time docked in New Orleans. And those river boats helped spread the music, the language. They did. That's right. Yeah. That's exactly. So we know that a lot of this tradition that we're talking about, even though musicians today attend conservatories and read books, it's still passed on orally from musician to musician. And so did you have a chance to really sit down with Professor Longhair or James Booker or these other giants? Did you know them? Did you have a chance to ask questions? And what did they teach you? I did know them, and uh, Alvin Batiste, who I've mentioned before, who was one of my mentors in college, actually did set up a session for me to study with Professor Long here. Um, but there, there were several ways of, of learning from these guys. One was certainly being with them and, and asking questions and really listening to them play and then maybe trying to emulate what they just did. Um, and then the other way for me was just to listen to the records and kind of figure things out uh, based on the academic stuff that I knew. Um, and based on, see, I mean, I, I was fortunate, I, at least I felt fortunate. I I was uh, doing all this school stuff, but um, after I got out of school and did all the, my homework and that kind of thing, I could go and hang out with musicians that were playing in the nightclubs and playing wherever they were playing uh, in the community and, and learn that way as well. So I didn't always need to be with the musician. Uh, or with the person that I was studying. Um, I'm always studying. Mm -hmm. And um, so, and then for James Booker, well, I... Why don't you tell people who James Booker was? Yeah. James Booker was a phenomenal pianist. He was a guy who could fuse a little Grieg, a little Debussy, a little almost uh, maybe even Beethoven, into a blues and make it work. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm, I, do, I do that, but I don't do it the same way, so I'm not going to demonstrate that. Um, I, I tend to want to fuse uh, some Schubert kinds of things or more, more like um, sometimes atonal um, or um, 
sometimes impressionistic uh, melodies or flavors into blues or jazz and sometimes it works and sometimes you know I just have to be happy that the moment passed you know so I, I know so many pianists who study this New Orleans piano tradition mm -hmm. like yourself I mean you are that tradition you're not just studying it or like Harry Connick Jr. they all cite James Booker and well Robert James Harry. Booker was Harry's principal teacher is that right uh, especially in his years from about 12 to, I don't know, 15, 16, 17. When you say teacher, does this mean people would go to their home for lessons? He actually went to Harry's home to hmm. teach him. I see. And, you know, James was a funny kind of a guy. He, he would get into all kinds of trouble, and the DA, who was Harry's father, um, Harry Connick Sr. Uh, would, I mean, he actually employed James Booker to teach his son as a way, as one of the ways of keeping him out of jail. And it wasn't necessarily an employment thing. It was kind of a thing. It's okay, if you do this, you know, I will make sure that you stay out of jail, regardless, you know. And he couldn't always keep him out, but he did what he could. I mean, James Booker was a user, and um, he also used the vehicle of informancy to keep himself out of jail from time to time. Mm -hmm. So he was an interesting character. I, I mean, I, I, we wound up doing double bills together, uh, and he'd come to my gigs from time to time, but I chose not to hang out with him because he, he had a different lifestyle and I wasn't quite, I wasn't necessarily interested in that. He was a special piano player. Oh, he definitely was. What did you think of his organ playing? I, I liked his work. Mm -hmm. I liked his work. I mean, but I'm, I'm, I'm particularly interested in piano. Um, so I, appreciated that more uh, but yeah he was he was a musician mm -hmm. um, he could rearrange uh, he could he was a good arranger he was um, um, he wasn't maybe maybe he wasn't as consistent as we might have liked him to be uh, and a lot of that had to do with whether he got what he needed before he started playing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that's, and so many of the uh, club owners, <coughs> if they could get their hands on what he needed, then they made sure he was right. Mm -hmm. yeah. You've mentioned Alvin Batiste a yes. couple of times. Great clarinetist. We lost him quite recently. Yes. What was your course of study with Alvin? Um, was it more musicological? Was he actually teaching you piano, or was he teaching you about how to improvise in fourths? Because he was a very strong uh, harmonic very improviser. That's very strong in chordal harmony, and very strong in teaching um, all kinds of multi-ethnic uh, things, including styles, including, uh, I mean, one of the things we had to do in our first year was to transcribe some of the things we were hearing, including uh, uh, some music from Panama, and, and uh, I also had to transcribe <coughs> McCoy's solo on uh, Equinox, mm -hmm. um, and we also worked on how to shift rhythms, how to make rhythmic shifts, so that we could start. We might start playing in a samba type rhythm, and we would wind up. We might wind up, say, swinging that. So 
Show us. We might uh, do do uh, something like. So basically, as we uh, worked on the the, uh, the the how rhythms are formed and shaped, um, we also worked on uh, realizing nexus points. Nexus points meaning uh, the connecting points. So you have to. You can't just go from one style rhythm to the other one without uh, some uh, maybe preparation or um, I mean you have to be able to it's like a modulation it's a you have harmonic modulations and you have rhythmic modulations and you have uh, perhaps uh, stylistic modulations. Right, so uh, anything you can modulate from one style to another, or from one rhythm, from one harmony, one um, melody, if you're if you're good enough. If you know how. If you know how. If you have the right information. Got to have the turnaround. Yeah. I, kn I know you're an educator yourself. First of all, what do you think makes a good teacher of music? Well, a good teacher of anything, I think. Uh, um, I think you have to have some knowledge, not just information. When What's you, the difference? Well, I think I think information. Uh, anybody can have information, but if you're able to use that information and if you're able to apply it, then it becomes your knowledge. It becomes. Uh, you can even go to a different place and say, um, if a person has wisdom, mm -hmm. so that applying it is one thing. Uh, that's that that means that you have knowledge of that subject matter. Um, you know, w wisdom may mean that you can actually. Uh, apply it not just in the standard or normal way, but you can actually take that knowledge and uh, maybe impart it to others, uh, try maybe bring unrelated elements together perhaps, uh, create uh, something that seems new. Can you teach someone to swing or is this something innate? I have taken young Caucasian kids, and one of the reasons why I took the job, I took a university job in uh, Charleston, Illinois, in 1990, and I took it partly to see uh, if I could actually take kids from scratch and take kids from a totally different culture, a totally different subculture, take kids who were in the cornfields and 
and the cotton and the soybean fields and you know just really work with them in a, in a, in a different way and, 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 and see what I could learn from that as well as see what, they, uh, what I could Im impart to them. Uh, I have to tell you, most of the kids that I worked with had no prior understanding, although they wanted to major in jazz, they had prior, no real understanding of what jazz was. And I think we did a pretty good job. Um, I wouldn't say that, I wouldn't say that I taught them as much as I was a good guide for them and I was a good coach and I was, um, I mean, I was a teacher in, in, in the sense that we use the word. Um, but the main thing is they got it. They, they got it, and as I have one kid who is now up in Vermont at one of the um, one of the one of the great schools up there, one of the private, um, very well-funded schools, uh, teaching and creating a jazz program up there, and. Uh, and I've heard some of his students, and he 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 definitely got it because he's given it to them. So I'm I'm happy about that. We had other kids who uh, were good players, and um, for some reason uh, they got sidetracked and got into uh, using substances that unfortunately didn't uh, allow them to do much with their art. I know you have a lot to pass on. Experience, insight, knowledge, information, wisdom. Do you think you'll go back to teaching? Well, I love it. I love it. And I, I, I may, if it's the right situation. I, uh, we do have a camp that we uh, um, were trying to get that started again uh, and we started doing these camps for blind and partially sighted kids back in 94 and we got them we actually started doing them because at all of my workshops and seminars around the country I, I never encounter or I never met any of the any blind students there mm -hmm. and I started wondering what they were getting and um, so when I did my first workshop in uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina, I th actually I think that was 93, um, I realized that uh, I could make a contribution there. So we started doing camps in St. Louis in 1994, and then we moved it to Indianapolis in 96. And um, and then we brought it to New Orleans in 2003. And in after the 2005 camp, there was Katrina. Katrina devastated the facilities, and uh, they haven't they haven't really restored those facilities uh, down there. So we can't do it there. So now we're looking in the Northeast. Uh, hopefully, either next year or in 2009, we'll be able to start that camp up again. You mentioned Katrina. I must ask, what was your experience with not only the hurricane, but its aftermath? Well, my house was wiped out. My house was devastated. Which neighborhood were you? Uh, I was in the Gentilly neighborhood, which is not far from Lake Lakeview area. Uh, we got it from the levees and we got it from the canals. Um, and so my house got it from all sides. <coughs> and uh, Did you have to evacuate just before? Or I left, yeah, a day before, oh. a day before the storm. And where did you go? Uh, 
I went up to North Louisiana, uh, up in up to a town called Farmerville. Now I know you probably haven't heard of Farmerville, but it's about 12 miles from Ruston, Louisiana. That's where Louisiana Tech is. And it's about 60 miles from Monroe. <coughs> and I remember uh, after I'd been in that town for a few days, I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll just go to this church. And I mean, because I normally don't go to uh, Baptist churches. Um, but the, the people that were, that were putting us up uh, were Caucasians and really nice people, but they were also a product of the, the subculture up there. And, um, which means what? Which means that they were a little bit behind on race relations and, and uh, you know, having people who were not in their race come to their churches. So I decided, well, you know, I'll go to this church and, and just, you know, give them some music, you know, show my appreciation for um, them taking us in. And um, of course, when I went into this church up there, um, the, 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 the people that were putting us up knew we were coming and they were delighted that we were willing to do that. Uh, but when we got to the church, there was this deep gasp, or this deep breath taken by some of the people. Um, and when we walked in, I mean, everything was nice and quiet. And the pastor, uh, I think he appreciated our being there. And I got to play some music, some some religious stuff for the people that were there, and uh, and I think they wound up really appreciating it, appreciating it. Uh, but it's a very small town. I mean, very small town. Um, probably the smallest smallest town I've ever spent more than a week in. Um, and what did you take with you? I mean, you didn't I have much time to gather. Your no, belongings. that's right. So what did you take? What did you sa choose to save? I took maybe four or five changes of clothing. I think what, that's what happened with most people who had to evacuate. They, they, like I, felt that we'd be able to go back in four or five days, uh, like most other storms that we've gone through. Um, but as we sat glued to CNN uh, the Monday that the storm hit, uh, actually more like Tuesday when it started really flooding uh, because of the levees, um, we realized that there wasn't much of a chance that we'd get back there that soon. As a matter of fact, <coughs> as it started flooding, they mandated that we kind of stay out of the city until they opened up certain areas for us to come back. Um, I, I lost uh, my, all of my musical tools, including my piano, uh, all of my recording equipment, clothes, work clothes, um, everything, computers, all of that. Now some things can be replaced, but what did you lose that was irreplaceable? Well, you know, the memories, um, I mean, it was, it was certainly a, a wonderful house, a uh, wonderful place for me to live. Uh, I lost scores. I lost masters that haven't been replaced, and I'm not sure if we can replace them. Uh, when I say masters, I mean recorded masters. Master tapes. Yeah. yeah. And um, uh, it's just, uh, and, and some masters that were on disk drives, you know, that kind of thing. And why do you think it's taking so long to rebuild the city? 
there's several reasons for that, and some of them are political, and some of them just have to do with incompetence uh, on all levels, local, state, and national. And I think, I, I, I think that people who live in, say, D.C. or New York, some people in New York may be realizing it. As, as a matter of fact, I'm sure that there are people in New York who realize it, but there are most people across the country just don't understand what happened. When I, when I say that, I mean that all of a sudden the cultural footprint of this country is smaller uh, because uh, there's just not uh, a lot of the people who created that culture and the people who were, con who were continu continuing to create the culture. A lot of those people aren't back in the city, and a lot of those people can't get back, uh, partly because they were, they were rich musically, but they were poor economically. And so many of those people who were renting um, won't be able to get back into the city because the rents are going up. They've gone up at least 20, 30 um, percent. And there's just been no, there's just been no real um, sensitivity to the culture by any of the politicians there. And that's, that's very sad. So since we're at a closing point, and we've been talking about New Orleans, and you're sitting at a piano, could you play something for us that expresses your feeling for that city? Well, everything, <coughs> well, everything that I got in my beginning years um, came indirectly from, or directly from, New Orleans. So, um, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to play a piece that I wrote uh, back in 1978, and uh, it has little glimpses of blues and jazz and gospel and maybe even some street beat mm. stuff. <coughs> it's titled Orleans Inspiration.
Henry Butler, it's been a pleasure. I hope we get to continue this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.